Oh, the ever calm, ever cool person who has helped me navigate uh, up up to this point is the reason why I'm I'm very calm, even though the charts are not showing, because I know that they will come, and I set it up so that if we had a bit of an issue, I could speak a little bit before it was an it it became a problem. Was independence to invoke Professor Samir Amin, that outstanding scholar? A miracle that led nowhere for the majority of Africans. Pio Gama Pinto, the uncomparable freedom fighter, Mao Mao, journalist, trade unionist, and humanist, used to say, and I quote, Uhuru, which is Swahili for freedom and independence, Uhuru must mean Uhuru for the masses, end of quote. To him, there could be no freedom, no independence, when the majority of our compatriots continue to languish in mass misery. In keeping with this theme, may I ask that we honor the only woman who made it to field marshal in the Mau Mau, Muthoni Wakirima. This is a Pan-Africanist event and Muthoni Wakirima has just passed away. Her funeral is actually just being organized. So I believe that as a great revolutionary, a Pan-Africanist event must acknowledge her. Her story inspires me and fills me with sorrow simultaneously. She was outstandingly courageous as a revolutionary. She was a true humanitarian, hardworking, and tremendously strategic. From that, we must be inspired, for she was indeed a very inspiring woman. But where she reminded us that we had forgotten those who gave their lives for our freedom and liberation, what was our answer? Field Marshal Muthoni Wakirima reminded us of the extreme sacrifices the Mau Mau warriors made when she said, in the face of colonialism's primitive brutality and cruelty, many times. Am I to continue? There seems to be a disruption. Should I continue? Continue. I can continue, right? Yes, you can continue. Okay. okay. I, I guess somebody's working on getting my charts, right? Yes. Okay, sorry, somebody muted, uh, muted me. I've been unmuted now, so I can continue. Field Marshal Muthoni Wakirima reminded us of the extreme sacrifices the Mau Mau warriors made when she said in the face of colonialism's primitive brutality and cruelty, many times they did not even have time to bury their murdered colleagues and comrades. As she put it, hyenas ate their dead bodies. Yet in post-colonial Kenya, where a new monstrous predatory elite emerged soon after independence, people like Muthoni Wakirima were forgotten. She had to fend for herself by selling lemons in her destitution. Little wonder, she once said, and I quote her, up to date, the country is in the hands of collaborators. They are only concerned about their wealth and not the interest of the masses. Everything they own is because we fought for it. It's sad that many of us are either dead all live in deplorable states, end of quote. Those are really tragic words. Uh, sorry, I, I'm trying to do the presentation at the same time, uh, communicate with people who are asking me for, someone is saying, is the Zoom chat room, you are asking for what, please? No, I'm asking for my PowerPoint chart. You can give me the, you can give me the rights and I'll be able to share it myself, but it says that you've disabled the, the host participant screen sharing. That's why I'm not able to do it. I hope that is clear. I'll continue while you try, you try and sort it out. If you give me the rights, I can share it myself, but if you want to do it, okay, go ahead and let me drive the charts from here. The neglect of people like Mutoni Wakirima in post-colonial Africa, and even by those most recent sham neoliberal Santa Claus democracies, like the one we are practicing, 
is one of Africa's most stinging tales of tragedy. The Lumpen bourgeoisie has stolen and grabbed with both hands while our heroes perished in destitution. Ngugi Wationgo was right to describe this tragic reality when he bemoaned the consequence of neoliberal capitalism in his book, Petals of Blood, as the creation of societies in which you either eat or you're eating, you bite or you're bitten, the only way to stay clean is to wash your dirt, your sweat, your urine, your tears onto someone else's back. Ngugi Wationgo, a professor, super scholar, freedom fighter, revolutionary, and more, then ominously reminded us of our revolutionary mission when he stated that in our societies, there are some, the many in fact, who have neither the claws nor the fangs with which to pray. The revolutionary mission of a reimagined Pan-Africanism for the 21st century must therefore be about how to liberate the productive forces in order to achieve shared dignity and shared prosperity in our societies. Uh, give me a minute. I've been asked to, to share my, my presentation. Um, yeah. Screen. Oh, oh, sorry, this is happening. Guys, I'm, unab I'm unable to select a window screen. It's, it's not working. Okay, look. Uh, Are you able to see my screen now? Yes, please. Hello? You're, okay, so then I'll open the presentation. If not, I will try without the charts. Uh, we are a Chicago boys. They say when sea dry, we go by land. So I will manage one way or the other, and we will get through the message. I just hope that we haven't lost too much time while all this has been going on. Um, Tell me if you can if you can see the charts. Can you see my charts? We can. Yeah, continue. You can see. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you very much. So we'll we'll go on. Okay. So I was at the revolutionary mission of a reimagined. I'll go a bit faster. So we make up for the time. The, revo the revolutionary mission of a reimagined Pan Africanism for the twenty first century must therefore be about how to liberate the productive forces in order to achieve shared dignity and shared prosperity in our societies. We must remember Josiah Mwangi Kariuki, also a Mau Mau veteran, booming that we do not want a society in which there are 10 millionaires and 10 million beggars. I repeat GM Kariuki's words, we do not want a society in which there are 10 millionaires and 10 million beggars. The words of another Mau Mau, the immortal Piogano Pinto, continue to ring true, and I quote him, Uhuru, that means freedom or independence, must not be transformed into freedom to exploit or freedom to be hungry and live in ignorance. Uhuru must be Uhuru for the masses. Uhuru from exploitation, from ignorance, disease, and poverty. End of quote. Field Marshal Mutoni Wakirima lived long enough for us to at least correct some of the wrongs we committed to those who died earlier. But did we? Che Guevara argued repeatedly that the true revolutionary is motivated by feelings of great love. Is it love that we who say we are interested in revolutionary change show to people like Mutoni Wakirima, freedom fighters who gave everything they had so we could, we could all be free? When we watch them sell lemons in destitution. I tremble with shame when I imagine the conversation Mutoni Wakirima is now having with her ex-comrades <laughs> who crossed the river to be with the ancestors earlier. The thousands of Mau Mau revolutionary whose names we should never ever, whose names we never ever got to know must forgive us all. We certainly could have done better. I am not a very keen advocate of charity as an organizing principle of society. I prefer to work for a society that does not need charity because everyone has dignity and human prosperity. It is because we live in broken societies that we sometimes seem to think more charity is the answer to all our problems. I am also not a fan of burying the fundamental issues of society in lifeless dogma and complex formalisms and arcane-isms. 
I believe in what works. To use Deng Xiaoping's imagery, I am more interested in whether the cat can catch mice than whether it is black or white. I think in terms of economic impact, Deng Xiaoping is the most historically significant leader that the human race has ever produced. Reforms that lead to 800 million people being raised from poverty have simply no precedent in human history. He guided us to keep focused on the essential task of development, not lifeless dogma. And I'm quoting Asia because you know that Kwame Nkrumah was on his way to Asia when the coup happened. Deng Xiaoping said, one, to, we should always see truth from facts, that all formalisms and postulations must and can only be proven in practice and by execution. His famous phrase rings true, we must cross the river by touching the stones. Two, Deng Xiaoping never stopped saying that the purpose of development, of government, of democracy, of revolution, whatever you wish to call it, is to liberate and emancipate the productive forces to improve the livelihoods of all. Everything else is secondary. Let us be very clear about that. Everything else is secondary. Democracy is not about being able to point to institutions and say that you have a parliament, a Supreme Court, whatever. Democracy is about improving the livelihood of the masses. And whatever we do, if that is not happening, then we need to pause and ask ourselves what is going on over here. I could end my presentation here, ask this really is my message today. If we truly love our neighbors, as 74% of our population who are Christian, they always say that love your neighbor as yourself. But if we truly love our neighbors as ourselves, we must work for day two to share in dignity and prosperity. The Christian mission, in my view, with 74% of our population claims to belong to, is a very revolutionary mission. It's not what it has become in some places today. We must not sit back and watch them in destitution as we hand over our loose change as charity to them. Chino Achebe made this point very, very falsely in Antils of the Savannah. The great professor Chino Achebe wrote, and I quote him, charity is the opium of the privileged, from the good citizen who habitually drops 10 kobo from his loose chain and from a safe height above the bowl of the leper outside the supermarkets to the group of good citizens like yourselves who donate water so that some Lazarus in the slums can have a syringe, boiled clean as the whistle for his job and his sores, dressed more hygienically than the rest of him, to the band-aid stars that lit up so dramatically the dark Christmas skies of Ethiopia. Now listen carefully to Achebe. It says, while we do our good works, let us not forget that the real solution lies in a world in which charity will have become unnecessary. I wish that that would be printed and put on our coat of arms. End of quote. Our real obsession, therefore, should be creating a world where there is socioeconomic justice, a society that can claim that it has shared prosperity, shared dignity, and shared humanity. We must continue with all our intellectual, spiritual, and material resources to campaign for the liberation and emancipation of the productive forces by stimulating the creativity and willingness to work hard of our compatriots in order that in the words of revolutionaries of another era and place, we may achieve liberté, égalité, fraternité, more liberty, more egalitarian opportunity, and more fraternity. Development, I say again, is about the reordering of the social relations, all of them. When I say social relations, all of them, not just class, gender, race, creed, etc., all of them around the means of production. We do this in order to improve livelihoods. That is the fundamental purpose. We do this in order to improve livelihood so that the long-term health of society can be secured. None of all of this can be achieved without courageous leadership. Field Marshal Mutoni Wakirima was an exceptionally courageous leader. I raise my fist in salute to her. Shall we never forget her? Shall we never forget her colleagues in the London Freedom Army, an army that had iconic status among anti-colonial liberation fighters all across the periphery? Field Marshal Didan Kimati, Field Marshal Musa Mwarima, General Baimungi, General Ruku, General Matenge, General China, General Gachenja, General Indege, General Kagia, General Kula Twende, General Mukarange, 
General Mengo and all the others, we salute you. We thank them all and commit to them anew that the struggle for a just society continues in words cobbled together from their own comrades, Pyogama Pinto and J.M. Karuki. We do not want a society of 10 millionaires and 10 million beggars. Uhuru must mean Uhuru for the masses. Asante sana and Kwahiri, Kwahiri Kabisa, Shuja Field Marshal Mutoni Wakirima, we are gathered here today to ensure that the struggle continues. I pray to the ancestors, all of them, including you, Kwame Nkrumah and Nelson Mandela, to give us the strength to do what we have come here to do. Thank you very much. Now we shall proceed with the actual presentation and I'll go quite quickly because we lost some time. <laughs> the intangible shall prevail over the tangible. This is an old philosophical thought. The intangible shall prevail over the tangible. You go all the way back to Plato is there, but many others have said it before. The intangible shall prevail over the intangible. The, the intangible shall prevail over the tangible. Our independence movements and the actual attainment of independence in Africa filled us with hope and euphoria. These movements were filled with great expectations and fired the imagination of Africans everywhere. Patrice Lumumba, the friend of Kwame Nkrumah, declared in a fiery and truly historical speech written in longhand as he listened to King Baldwin of Belgium describing Belgian colonialism on the day of Colon Congolese independence in Congo, King Baldwin dared to say that Belgian colonialism was the culmination of a civilizing mission for Africans. Patrice Lumumba exploded in righteous rage and he answered him in a speech. He rewrote his speech as he was sitting on the stage. You watch the video, you see him rewriting it. He said, and I quote, the colonialists care, in, care nothing for Africa. No, he said the, colonial, the colonialists care are not in Africa for her own sake. That's the colonialists are not in Africa for her own sake. They are attracted by African riches. Their actions are guided by the desire to preserve their interests in Africa against the wishes of the African people. For the colonialists, all means are good if they help them to possess these riches. Capturing the imagination of revolutionaries all over the world, given the speech was broadcast on radio globally, Patrice Lumumba thundered with insight and conviction in continuation. And I quote, political independence has no meaning if it is not accompanied by rapid economic and social development. Without dignity, there is no liberty. Without justice, there is no dignity. And without independence, there are no free men. These are immortal words. The day will come, said Patrice Lumumba, almost in a prophetic way, when history will speak, but it will not be the history which will be taught in Brussels, Paris, Washington, or the United Nations. Africa will write its own history, and in both North and South, it will be a history of glory and dignity. I pause because what we must reflect on is why has the post-colonial reality, up till now at least, so underdelivered? compared to the sunny optimism that characterized the big idea of independence all over Africa. Kwame Nkrumah had said that independence, that the black man must prove to the world that he's capable of managing his own affairs. His good friend Ahmed Sekuturi powerfully underlined that the only, only the African people would make their own history. Mwalimu Julius Nyerere of Tanzania urged the African people to run where others had walked because we were starting from behind. The zeitgeist was a new era of African liberation that would see the continent flourish. While there has been some minimal progress, I take the view, and I suspect many of you do, that African independence cannot have delivered on its promise if in 2023 so many of our compatriots continue to live in poverty. Karl Marx defined class struggle as the issue of the 19th century. W.E.B. Du Bois pointed out at the color line as the defining issue of the 20th century, I argue that egregious inequality, eliminating poverty, is the major problem facing humanity in the 21st century and beyond. Today's leaders must organize to liberate the productive forces and to activate the creative energies of those they lead in order to improve livelihoods. This is the central task of development. It is also the central task of 
of our democracy or of government itself. And that's the point that I'm, I'm making over here. Revolutions have always been powered by big ideas. I show you some over there. Revolutions have always been powered by big ideas. And the big idea of the 21st century governance construction and of democracy has to be that it delivers improved living conditions, dignity to the mass of our people. Nothing else is acceptable if we are not able to do that. For those who know about the Bolshevik revolution, I should have added that, you know, that Lenin actually said for bread and peace. And the point that I'm making is not a new one. I quoted Deng Xiaoping, but people in Africa have made a point. In 1966, Amilcar Cabral said this, and I'll just read it to you. The great revolutionary, Amilcar Cabral, he made the point, or maybe you can read it, so I'll just summarize it. The point that he was making here was that people do not just follow ideas. They, they follow the ideas in expectation of material improvements to better their lives. It is a reasonable expectation and we should never forget it. When we get lost in all sorts of esoteric arguments and try to justify things and talk about institutional arrangements, while in Ghana where we sit today, the April Partners Report says 68% of our population lives in families that can be classified as low income. Low income is just a euphemism for saying that they are living in poverty. That is almost 70%, seven out of 10 people in, in our society. How then can we say that we have a democracy, we have independence, and so on, when we leave so many of our compatriots in this sort of situation? As yet, independence has not delivered shared prosperity and shared dignity. I'll keep making this point. And for that reason, the idea of independence, the very idea of independence, is endangered. This is the point that Kwame Nkrumah made with, with neocolonialism. My very good friend, childhood friend, actually one of the people I've known the longest, we're in school together and so on and so forth, Akosi Obami, has written three books on mindset revolution. I recommend them to you because they are long texts. It will be useful to read them because he's making the sort of point that Amilcar Cabral made when he said the first dimension of revolution is cultural. It has to do with mindsets, the way that you see even in China. Deng Xiaoping's first move was to say enhance mindset. You have to get a mindset right. You have to be able to have the courage to, to dream, the attitude to work, to be productive before you can make stuff happen. Now, you can read that chart for yourself, so I won't read it. One way in which the African condition is endangered is the all-pervasive failure of mindsets you see all around us. Anomic conditions, chronic indiscipline, lack of ambition, a deficit of self-confidence, debilitating inferiority complex and more, they characterize our reality today. We must begin by radically uplifting our mindsets to imagine and work for a better tomorrow. We must say thank you to Akosia for doing this. I just want us to briefly because we're we are here, we built this program around Mandela and, and Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, I will not read these to you. These are quotes that you know well, but I thought we'll just pause and reflect on some of their words as we talk about the sort of mindsets that we need in order to be able to progress. They were way ahead of their time when they said these things. Their words were true there, and they remain true even today. So I will now quickly go through 10 principles because I was asked to talk about leadership for the 21st century. I call it a reimagined re Pan-Africanism. And I'll now quickly go through 10 principles. I've deliberately taken somebody from business, Paul Polman, who you see there, and Bola Tinubu, because I deliberately also took somebody from contemporary pol uh, West African politics. None of them is perfect. None of them even holds themselves as iconic. But nonetheless, there are still some things that we can learn from them. So my first principle is that you keep your enemies close, which seems very paradoxical. But as Tinubu says, if you don't keep your enemies close, how do you know what they are up to? They understand both men, bridge building, and this is absolutely critical in the modern real world, particularly in our context where party politics has now driven us absolutely crazy. Uh, the identity of partisanship is now more important than even our, our Africanness and our Ghanaianness. We must remember this, that unless we are willing to build bridges, work in coalitions and networks and so on, we don't move. Uh, Pullman, uh, when he came to Unilever, we were always having issues with NGOs. 
And all of us were grumbling about, oh, these guys harass us because we're a big business. He said, bring them in. It is because you don't show them respect. You don't take your things to them and get inputs. That's why they treat you the way they treat you. So he invited them in. We showed our things to them for 10 years. There was a, an environment of collaboration. There was absolutely never an eruption. Uh, Bola Tinubu is there because those who know a little bit about Nigeria, and I suspect that there are Nigerians who are listening and some who are sitting in the room, know it is no secret that at some point he and his successor in Lagos State fell off. Baba Tunde Fashola. But when Tinubu was now looking for somebody who he could trust, who he knew was a hardened campaigner to lead his presidential campaign, he went for the guy who he had once fallen out with. To be able to do things, it is important that we build bridges. And this degree or this Santa Claus democracy that has surrounded us, I call our society, has become a Robinson Crusoe society, where we now have more loyalty to, to parties than to the big ideas of nation building and continental liberation. We really must think very, very hard about how it is that we allowed ourselves to get into this, into this space. Deng Xiaoping, to go back to him, kept his principles. There were many reasons. Mao Zedong rusticated him three times. Indeed, Deng himself said that for 10 years, I was sent to live in the cow shed. But when he came out, he said, look, for 36 years, Mao got it right. He was our great leader. He made some mistakes, but I too have made mistakes. And the day I die, if I, Deng Xiaoping, is told that I got 60% right and 40% wrong, I'll take it like that because I'm a human being. Therefore, I recognize Mao Zedong as my leader and I, will, I want him rehabilitated. This is a guy who for 20 years had been marginalized. He came to the top, then he was top for three times, but he knew because he said the thoughts that were written down by Mao in the first 36 years would power China going forward with a few alterations. And therefore he was not going to go for vengeance. Our political environment, not just in Ghana, but in many parts where we are now practicing this blind allegiance to the neoliberal democracy, this is not how the African people have traditionally organized themselves. It has broken down the spirit of community, the spirit of solidarity. We are no longer able to think about nation building. We must sit down and think what we are going to do about this. The second principle is that you must know your context. Absolutely know your context. Great leaders are masters of their context. I have wondered many times, for example, whether a person like Bola Tinubu can be effective outside the unique circumstances of Nigeria. As a person who lived in Nigeria for six years, I know what I'm talking about. But in Nigeria, he has so far been unbeatable. Whatever you think about him, and there's a lot that you can say about him that is not great, he has been unbeatable. The guy has never lost an election before, and he has stood many elections. Even his worst critics will tell you that when it comes to operating in the political context of Nigeria, there is a lot to learn from the guy. Kwame Nkrumah, especially as a mass mobilizer, had this. He understood the times and space in which he operated in Ghana. He could fire the imagination of ordinary people in a way none of his upper class political opponents could. He was at ease with his context and with ordinary people. And for that, they were branded Veranda boys and so on and so forth. But you saw what happened in elections. He always, he always just sailed ahead. He spoke the language of the ordinary man. He kept the company of the ordinary people. And in return, they loved him. Deep proximity with the people brings deep appreciation and deep understanding of their circumstances. It is the only way real insight and empathy can be built. When I see today that so many African leaders are locked behind very high walls and fortresses, far away from the masses, in what they call state house, whatever it is, far away from the masses they claim to lead, how are they ever really going to know the truth about how their people live? They cite insecurity, but it is poor policies like neoliberal capitalism or what others call bourgeois liberalism that create income polarization and make violent crime preponderant. We must fix this in Africa. Political leadership that only visits people with large hordes of security in their trail and TV cameras everywhere soon become disengaged from reality. They start to claim things that surprise many others because everything gets set up for them and is false and fake. And they themselves do not ask sufficiently rigorous questions when people present them with made up numbers and claims. If we had indeed, for example, in Ghana, 
had the food and agricultural supply breakthroughs that officialdom claims for planting for food and jobs, phase one, the agricultural policy of Ghana, for those who may not know, can someone then explain to us why with, with such, such supply gluts as people are claiming, food inflation also hits 59.7? It is impossible. One or the other is not right. Either the food glut did not happen or the 59.7 number did not happen, but the 59.7 number is from the Ghana Statistical Service. That too is an agent of government. So we have a crisis here. I choose to believe the 59.7% as food inflation figure, and therefore I have huge question marks over the claims that are being made about the bumper supply. We need to see more credible evidence, but this is what happens when you're not sufficiently close. If, for example, one claim that I saw said 400,000 toilets have rarely been built, how is it that in a country of only 32 million people, you build 400,000 toilets, that degree of infrastructural expansion and the opinification numbers hardly move? That is like somebody saying to me, I filled your petrol tank with petrol, and I believe him. But my gauge, which I know to be working, is lying on empty. And I say, because this man told me, I'm going to go on a thousand kilometer journey because I believe that there's petrol in. But the gauge is telling me this is not, the numbers just don't record, sir. When we say that, but for Ukraine and COVID, Ghana's neoliberal policies were on track economically, we must also answer the question why did other, other countries, so many others, not experience general inflation of 54%? with food inflation almost touching 60%. Why? They too experienced experience Ukraine and COVID. So why didn't it happen? We have to be more sincere with ourselves. The only way we can correct our issues if we, is if we are willing to face them and say that we made errors. And these are the lessons. All of us are human beings. We make mistakes. So the key thing is not to say that you never make mistakes, to admit the mistakes that we all sit down and say, how do we work our way going forward from here? Deep questioning brings integrity to public discourse and enables true accountability. Unfortunately, our political culture is such that as soon as you ask these questions, they say, oh, you don't like us. No, that's not it. We must ask these questions so that we can improve the livelihoods of all of us and get a better society for the future. It's not about who you like and who you do not like. I don't care about all these parties. For me, they are all part of the Robinson Crusoe society. They've lost their way completely. And unless radical changes are made, I do not see how they can land any transformation of any sort. With this over-monetized democracy that we are practicing, we will continue to be a Robinson Crusoe society if this is what we, we continue to do. People then dare not mislead their leaders if the leaders are in touch with the masses because they know the leader will check and know because they are in touch with what is going on in the grassroots. When in Ghana today, someone tells you that the ban on Galamse is working, Please check when and how the ban is working before you announce it. When and how did this, this ban start to work? Paul Kagame, for example, in Rwanda, says after decades in the bush, fighting for basic dignities with his people, he was in the bush with them, very little surprises him. You can't get just all sorts of funny rumors past him because he will check and he will find out what is going on. So the people dare not even feed him with those sorts of stories. Proximity to the people brings specificity and granularity to leadership communication. Check out the communication of Deng Xiaoping when he started the reform. He said the reforms will move China from $200 GMP per capita per annum to $800 GMP per capita per annum in 20 years, 1980 to 2000. That was point one. Point two, he said these numbers will be a proxy for industrial and agricultural output. Point three, he said the reforms will begin in the rural areas where 80% of the Chinese population, 800 million at the time, were living as peasants in poverty. And he warned the bourgeois in China or the upper classes in, 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 in China that unless the livelihoods of the peasants, the 800 million peasants in the rural areas were improved so that they had basic dignities, there would be no future China. The country would never be stable. Therefore, they had to focus there. The first three years of the reform were exclusively focused on raising lives, livelihoods in, in the rural areas, instigating the forces, the productive forces of agriculture, taking money into the rural economy. And so it was only when you started to see stabilization there that they moved into the, the cities. He also added that $800 GMP per capita will not make most countries of the West 
moderately prosperous as China was aiming to do. China was, didn't start out, I'd say, we wanted to be the richest country in the world. All they were focused on was that they would improve the livelihood of their people. But he made the point, very simply, that because China had better egalitarian distribution, you didn't have just a huge amount of money in 10 people's hands because they were multi-billionaires, if they got to $800 GMP per capita, you would see significantly raised standards of living. And so he didn't want to go so fast that he would bend down the system. They should first go for 800. Of course, they went faster. They achieved 1,000 and so on and so forth by, by 2,000. At $800 GMP per capita, Deng said in his messaging, China will become a $1 trillion economy. And then he pointed out to the people that if at $1 trillion you put 10% GDP, behind edu education, that is a hundred billion. You transform the country. Very simple imagery that people could understand. The message was crisp, realistic, and understood and communicated in ways that the masses could understand and therefore it set their imagination and their creative energies on fire and mobilized the peasants behind a big, big idea. Unsurprisingly, therefore, every single communicated target was exceeded. Compare the crispness of this communication to, say, the communication that followed Ghana beyond it. Beyond the slogan, how many Ghanaians could say in granular terms what we were going for? We create office after office, appoint too many people who then, to justify their existence, write meaningless papers that keep many ideas talking but doing nothing. Whereas they make up outright lies to please the boss and then start dysfunctional rivalry, each trying to outdo the other for the boss's favor. So teamwork collapses and the state becomes incompetent from the bureaucratic chokehold that takes place. This is the worst case scenario for any leader. For in no time, they will be naked kings dancing out in public, believing that they are clothed in the best garments because they have been told so. All their promises will not be delivered and then their slogans will be what the immortal Samira mean, described as miracles that led nowhere. Chronic short-termism then takes over. Leaders must cut through such bureaucratic chokeholds and speak with the people directly. Then Xiaoping bemoaned such dense bureaucracies with the felicitous descriptions. When he said about the Chinese bureaucracy, when he said he would reduce the numbers, he said, there are too many temples and in each of them, too many deities. And we have to reduce this. Principle number three, I'll step up, I'll go a bit faster. When asked whether he was a ruthless man or not, Lee Kuan Yew said, I am not a ruthless man, but when I say I will do something, people know I am serious. Leaders have to be taken serious. That is absolutely right. If you cannot eat spice, do not join revolution. This is the word, these are the words of, of German Mao. You, you cannot be a leader hoping to achieve structural transformation, and then your people do not take you serious. It cannot be right that a president takes his office on ending illegal mining, Galam say, but nothing happens. The neoliberal state is an incompetent state that produces weak leaders. We cannot continue like this with states in Africa that are so incompetent they are incapable of enforcing even their own good laws. What kind of society do we hope for when we buy the neoliberal fallacy that the private sector by itself can replace the agency of the competent state. How? Which people have ever done this? Yet all over Africa, you hear politicians parroting these fallacies with, of course, a few exceptions, sometimes like in places like Rwanda. Leadership is not for timid people to make changes that have never been tried before, such as the Chinese reforms, requires courage, grit, and determination. You must be willing to try new things, dare, take risk, fail fast, and sometimes when you fail, learn from the mistakes and course correct quickly. You cannot sit at the top, aloof and disengaged like a cuddly teddy bear while your people are suffering. I believe Deng Xiaoping put it best. He says, a leader of major reforms in societies must dare to touch the backside of the tiger. You must dare to touch the big backside of the tiger or achieve nothing structural and significant by way of improvement. Nelson Mandela in his last years was presented as the ultimate conciliatory person. Uh, it forgets what the man's history was.
But when Sonny Abacha dared the Commonwealth heads of states and killed Ken Saro, we were the well saw the old man, Nelson Mandela. He went after Abacha in a way that we have never seen a modern head of state go after an another person because he, need he needed to teach him a lesson there. So you cannot have timid leaders. At this point of our evolution in Africa, we need people, Obama said, strong institutions, not strong men. We do need strong people as well. I need to move on another meeting quickly, so I'll, I'll go quickly. Uh, play the long game. I don't want to talk too much ab about this because our, our time is, 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 is running fast. But when you wake up in the morning in this world, remember that what you think, what you want, there's a reason why when we go to bed, in spite of the fact that we say that we should love our neighbors as ourselves, we lock our doors. So remember all the time that what is around you, the reality, is not necessarily what you want to be. You have your vision and your dream, but you may not get there uh, in, in real time. And so you must adapt to a world that has some cruelty and brutality and always be, be ready for that. Uh, Samir Amin reminds us all the time that the world is an interstate battle, is in an interstate battle for world hegemony and global domination. That is not going to change. There'll be people competing for our resources. They are looking at their self-interest. That's not going to, to go away. We must navigate in, in that environment. And I have Drogba saying here, he says, when I walk onto the football field as a striker, I remember that there are 11 other players on the field and their main responsibility, apart from scoring themselves, is to stop me from scoring. Therefore, the chances that come to me, I must take them. Uh, this is something that we absolutely must remember. So we must play the long game. That's, that's what this is about. Play the long game. Don't always just go for short-termism and, and so on and so forth. And to be able to play the long game, we need, obviously, to build mastery. Uh, we need to be on top of, of, of our capabilities, be strong, be big. Yeah. Be strong, be big. Uh, make sure that we, we are world-class are the things that we do. And that's what Picasso is saying there. Diego Maradona says, a time comes when, as a great footballer, you know that you only are the person who can dribble six people and therefore, the ball must be passed to you. Uh, I make the point here that before you thrive, you must survive. Nikita Khrushchev said this during the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. So we are not fighting imperialism in order to die. We are fighting imperialism in order to make society better. We must keep that at the back of our minds all the time. When we go around and we do things, we must remember that if we don't survive, Saddam Hussein is always my example, erratic strategist. You bet your country, then your country gets destroyed. We cannot do that in, in Africa. I think the principle six, I have more or less made the point that we must keep flexible and keep adaptive and, and do things in a way that focuses and uses the African context as the context in which we are looking for original solutions for. That's the way that we must do things. Principle seven, have the courage, this is Noam Chomsky, have the courage to follow the path of integrity wherever it leads. Make the tough calls. Land reforms. How do we reform chieftaincy? Make the tough calls. This is Pope Benedict. I'm no Catholic myself, but Benedict, when he was a, he was a cardinal, was once confronted that if the Catholic Church did not become a little bit more amenable to people, they, they would lose a, their congregation. He said the smaller church may be a better church. Those who have become so drunk and intoxicated on our neoliberal democratic construction and are therefore always only thinking about votes can learn from this. Christopher Kibo, also when he was told that his writing was not accessible, he said, I write, I, writing is, he said, art is not a contest for the popular vote. It is something that we must keep in mind. Sometimes you have to do unpopular things if you are going to move society forward. And in that, we must never fear. We must absolutely go for it. Leadership can be absolutely hard work. As Achebe said, civilization does not fall from the sky. I want to quote his actual words. I know enough history to realize that civilization does not fall down from the sky, 
It has always been the result of people's toil and sweat, the fruit of their long search for order and justice under brave and enlightened leaders. Nothing the Chinese say that is enduring and that is sustainably useful comes without hard work. And then I want to remind you again of what Nikita Khrushchev, because it's crucial, whatever we do, we must survive. If we don't survive, we will not thrive. And the forces that led to colonialism, to imperialism, to the transatlantic slave trade, they still surround us in different ways. So if we don't guard ourselves, they could one day, because major powers come together, another Berlin conference, and what is our strategic response? We will pray, or what will we do? We have no strategic responses. Important that the human context is remembered. I don't think that I need to present this to you. You can look at it yourself. In all that we do, we in desiring change, in desiring revolution, in desiring true democracy, in desiring the liberation of the productive forces and improving the livelihood of the masses, we must remember that we have to look after ourselves. I have deliberately just let, uh, put some, some quotes from Toni Morrison, Angela Davies, and Wangari Matai. Maybe I should, I should just read them. I should just read them to you. Uh, Toni Morrison says, no, the function, the very serious function of racism is destruction. It keeps you, and let's remember when we talk Pan-Africanism, we're not just talking continental Africa, we're talking everywhere where the African people are. I believe that black is not a, ra a race. Black is a condition, is a certain lived experience of Pio Gamay Pinto and Joe Slovo and so on and so forth. All when we talk about black liberation, they are all part of it. And Toni Morrison is talking to all of us. No the function, the very serious function of racism is destruction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. None of that is necessary. There will always be one more thing. Angela Davis is talking about over-dependence on leaders. This is about the movement. It's also about ordinary people. When we talk about the Ghanaian independence struggle, we must also celebrate the market women, the veterans, all the people who contributed. Leadership is important, but leadership doesn't do it alone. And I particularly like what Gary Matai's quotes. He says, the real difference, he was asked about how she had been so successful in her greening project. He said, the real difference is making the commitment to dig a hole, plant a tree, and water it for life. You don't just give speeches. You don't just discuss the problem. You roll up your sleeves and get dirty. That is the only way you will make a difference. We must bear that in mind. Uh, here's Maya talking about courage being the most important of all virtues. We've talked about mindset revolution. It's the same thing that Michele Mugo, Amate do, are making. It's the same point that Winnie Mandela is, is also making. And I'm sure that you read it for yourself while the charts have been up, so I don't need to talk about it. Let us remember Antonio Gramsci when he said the pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. The reason I have Jibril Sisse here is because he told a fantastic story. 2005, Liverpool, European Championships, first half against AC Milan, down 3-0. Then they go for half time. Steve Gerrard says all the coaching officials should leave. He wants to talk to the staff alone. And he said to them, all I have left is Liverpool. When we go back onto that field, you play for your life. They went back. They got all the three goals back. Gerard scored one. He was fouled for a penalty. He scored. And, and then they went into penalties. And, and Liverpool won the, the, the European Championship. The commentator said Liverpool is back from the dead. The point I try to make with this is that there are times when rationality says to you that things cannot be done and all you have left is your will. And that's what Antonio Gramsci means when he says pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. We have been here talking, talking a lot. We have been here, I'm coming to, to a close now, talking a lot. The, the central point is the point that Karl Marx makes and which is, is, is put on his, on his tomb. In, in the 11 theses of Feuerbach, you all know this, philosophers have either to only interpret the world in various ways. The point is to change it. So after we have interpreted the world in this conference and in this meeting, how do we ensure that the next time that we come together, things will have changed? Again, we've talked about the downsides of humanity quite a bit. I would like to therefore end with some sort of positive way of looking at it. And one of the things that comes from the, the Nazi Holocaust survivor, Viktor Frankl, who says, we who lived in concentration camps, 
can remember the men who walked through the huts comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. I have already made this point. Essentially, development is about big ideas that reorder the social relations around the means of production by liberating and emancipating the productive forces. I would now like to end with a slogan of the Portuguese-speaking anti-colonial freedom fighters and their Cuban compatriots who came to fight and die on African soil to help us attain freedom. We bandy freedom around lightly, but it is the deepest and most enhancing condition of humanity. One day when we meet Kwame Nkrumah and Nelson Mandela and all the other ancestors I have mentioned today, may we be able to say we did our bid for freedom of the African people, true freedom. And in the words of Pio Gama Pinto, we will be able to say freedom, we made sure meant freedom for the masses. Until that day comes, Shall we be each other's keeper and love one another? Aduta continua, hasta la victoria semper, victoria aceta. The struggle continues, always towards victory. Victory is certain. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your conference.
Thank you very much. Please, with all due respect, kindly let us rise up on our feet, take an opening prayer, so then we can commence our program. Please let us pray. Our Almighty Father, we thank you for such a beautiful day. We thank you for the lives of all the people here. We thank you for the life of the Osajifu, Kwame Nkrumah, on whose date we are all here, and also for his brother, Nelson Mandela the Madiba, these great men who had lived such an awesome life that we are here today to celebrate them and to think of our continent, Africa, and our country, Ghana. Our continent is besieged with so many problems, but we believe that you have set a tone for turning around and giving us transformational leaders who change the lives and destinies of our people. We ask that you take chairmanship of this program and ensure that we have a successful program in Jesus' mighty name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Please let us kindly be seated. Indeed, yesterday we began the two day conference at the Nkrumah Mandela Leadership Conference. Yesterday had a lot of discussions with delegates from across the country and others from other African countries who have joined us, our brothers and sisters from the East African region, from Kenya, from Tanzania, from Congo DR. We also have our brothers from Nigeria who are joined and we wish to announce that we have over 500, 600 other delegates who are watching us virtually and joining in from on Zoom, on Facebook. We are also streaming live on my Enjoy News channel. Yesterday, we also streamed live on the Pan-African TV channel. So all those who are joining us online, we wish to welcome you as well. And welcome ourselves here, all of us here, who have made it a point to join us for the concluding part of our conference. We have indeed discussed the AU Agenda 2063. We've discussed the geopolitical challenges confronting Africa. We all know what is happening in Burkina Faso, in Niger, in Mali, and many other African countries. Indeed, as citizens of the earth, we've had pandemic, uh, a lot of issues, including the COVID-19 passing, We've also had the Russian-Ukraine war passing through a lot of conflicts and wars and issues across the globe. In Africa, where we are seeking for relative calmness for us to focus on development, unfortunately, we are also besieged with one problem or the other. Ladies and gentlemen, Osage for Dr. Cameron Kuma and Nelson Mandela stood for two main things, as I would want to put it. They stood for leadership. And they stood for leadership for the people. They served the people. They served the people of their respective countries. They served the people of the continent of Africa. And they championed the same. This evening, we want to step in their foot, learn from their traits, emulate the examples they lived for, and assure our nations and our continent, Africa, that there is still hope for us. It's all not lost because there's something we can look up to. There are some people we can look, look up to. For the Patrice Lumumbes who have passed, from the Mohammed al Gaddafis who have served, the Emperor Hale Selassie of Ethiopia, all across the continent, we've seen men and women who have stood up for our race, for our continent, and for the future that is ahead of us. We are not giving up 
And today, as we celebrate the birthday of Osajifo Dr. Kwame Renkuma, it becomes a clarion call on all of us to stand up to the call. In the AU Agenda 2063, we are all aspiring for the Africa we want. The Africa that I want, the Africa that you want, the Africa that we all want. What kind of Africa are we seeking? And who would make Africa what we want, if not us? You, myself, your friend, your family, your colleagues, and all of us who shares this aspiration and ambition together. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why we are here today. We are celebrating the, celebrating the birthday of Osajifu Dr. Kwame Kuma, but we are also taking solace from their words, their works, their lives, and what we can learn from. Don't let it be the usual celebration we come here and we go. You've committed time, you've committed um, yourself being here and committed to the aspirations and objectives that we've saved for this conference. On behalf of the organizers, which is the Kwame Kuma Center for Ideology, Governance and Leadership, Afraka Forward, the Institute of African Studies of the University of Ghana, which was set up by the Osajifu himself, and also, we've had tremendous support from the South African High Commission and the Nelson Mandela Foundation, with whom this concept was developed and to make sure that we give Africa the best when it comes to the great men who have lived and what their lives saved for. We wish to thank you all once again for making your time to come, and we hope that you are going to enjoy this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, to have such an August event, you bear with me that you really would have someone who would have to sit, sit in a chair, as we say in Africa, or in Ghana in particular, you need to have a chair who will steer the affairs of the program. So we looked and we searched and we found an enviable father who today looks so colorful and radiant a Pan-Africanist. Sincerely, Nana was not only invited, but he actually went to the conference website and registered to participate. And that was quite honest. So please, let's give him a round of applause. It's hardly you see a senior public officer, a chief, an academic, a Pan-Africanist, who will be so humble to want to go on the internet to register to participate in a conference when you want him there officially. Ladies and gentlemen, Nana is a traditional ruler also from Central Region. Those of you who know the history of Ghana knows that we started from Central Region, Ogwa, Cape Coast, where our first capital was. So in searching for, we're going back, coming forward, and heading towards the future. Nana is an Achimpem Hine, with the Ogwa Traditional Council and resides in Cape Coast, where Gold Coast began, where Ghana began, and where we've all gone through in our history with our emancipation and towards the renaissance of we, the African and black people. I want all of us with a rising and let's please acknowledge that champion meaning of Ogwa traditional area, Nana Kweku Ejiri Yebi the third, to chair this function for us. So I'm going to invite Nana, and Nana is going to give us his opening remark.
This shall be on our seat. First of all, I personally give thanks to all of our Africa ancestral spirit for this very important day as we celebrate our founding father, Usajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's birthday, alongside with our father, our brother, Madiba, South Africa, with us. It is a spiritual moment for all Africans in this room and those who are watching us from afar to understand that we have come a long way in our deliberations, our discussions, our struggle to make Africa greater than any nation in the world. I am not going to speak too much because we have a lot to work to do. I believe I'll come back again. I am deeply honored to be speaking, sitting on this platform to speak to all of you here. My greatest respect and honor. Thank you for making me the chair of this celebration. Thank you very much, Nana. So now that we have a chair, the chair would have to, you know, as a chief, when you sit in state, you don't sit alone. We also have very distinguished personalities who are joining us. One who has been our mother, who has been uh, everything in planning it. As a matter of fact, even when it's gotten tight in the last minute, she's able to control magic and get to able to help us go in. Ladies and gentlemen, please, with another round of applause, Let's welcome Her Excellency Grace Janet Mason, the High, Commission, High Commissioner for the South African High Commission, Ghana. For most Pan Africanists, you would also believe that we are socialists or social democrats at certain instances. We have a friend who has always joined us in solidarity with we African people, with we socialists and Pan Africanists. His Excellency Bijan Jeremy is the ambassador of Iran to Ghana. Africa we want also has to be a peaceful Africa. By protocol, we want to ensure security at the top and peace in the auditorium. I mean, as Corpon, Assistant Commissioner of Police, Emmanuel Akuno, to also join our elders on the table. ACP Akuno is standing in for the, the IGP who was invited. And distinguished ladies and gentlemen, please, let's rise up 
and also welcome the former Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana, um, Jesus Christ, the former Chancellor of the University of Cape Coast, and the former running mate of His Excellency, the former President John Dramani Mahama, <laughs> Her Excellency Jinana Poku Ajeman. She is going to be our special guest of honor. At the appropriate time, we'll introduce her very well when she's about to take the podium. Please, we'll keep standing. We are going to have the national anthems of South Africa and Ghana so that we'll be able to have the program again. Your Excellencies, please, would also indulge you to be on your feet. So we have the national anthems of South Africa and Ghana. you may be seated. Thank you very much. That is the Central Band of the Ghana Army. We are most grateful to you. We needed this anthem to be able to inspire us in our hearts, in our mind, and in our spirits that we have hope and we are alive. In Kosikelele, Africa just means God blessed our land, Africa, and that is from South Africa. And the Ghana National Anthem says, God bless our homeland, Africa. Shall we please ourselves a round of applause? Being part of this evening's or this afternoon's event, we would want to be having a motherly message from our High Commissioner for South Africa. But before then, we want all of us to relax. We're going to have some cultural performance from our group here. 
and then we would be able to calm our nerves. You know, when the national anthem is being played, you feel some kind of um, shivers in your spine. You know that, yes, this like reset. Sometimes you even want to salute. <laughs> it's such an awesome experience, okay? So if our dancers are around, we want to have some cultural display and we come our nerves, then we can start the conversation. Music and dance form part of our culture as Africans. And we're going to have a lot of music and dancing today because it's actually a celebration of the birthday of Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah.
Thank you very much, our wonderful cultural troop. So in 19, when we entered the 90s, 1900, then 1901, it's going, then it gets to 1909. Just three days before my birthday, if you know my birthday, Nkrumah came just three days after me. Oh no, he came three days before I did. I was born on 24th September. I will add the, the year later on. And then, 1909, Osage of Dr. Kwame was born. Just three years later, the people of South Africa had independence. Most people think South Africa had independence in 1993. No. Just a few years later, from 1909 to 1918, another great man just knocked at the womb of his mother and says, no one has appeared, I also have to appear. On 18th July 1918, Nelson Mandela was also born. So between 1909, 1918, these two great leaders were born on the continent of Africa. One south out of the Sahara, which is Ghana, the other one south of actually Africa. This Mandela was also born. It's interesting that these great men, just nine years apart, never met. History tells us in 1962, Nelson Mandela came to Ghana to come and sought after Saji for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Unfortunately, they didn't meet. He went back to South Africa, and the prison walls of South Africa were waiting for him. Whilst he was there, Osajifu began the, had begun and actually continued the transformational process. And then the plague that Africa is fighting with right now had set in. The good works of Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah had begun from 1951 when he became leader of the governor's business. Through, he became prime minister and he became president. He did not leave the full length of his time to finish his work. In the year 1966, there was an overthrow, a military coup in Ghana and overthrow of the Nkrumah regime. Later, when Nelson Mandela would still come out and sought after his mentor, he was nowhere to be found. In 1972, Nkrumah had gone. To so such great men, but never had opportunity to meet. And Africa, since then, have been struggling to identify transformational leaders. Today, I believe that if we all want to cast our eyes across the continent, we'll be wondering what is happening to us. So, ladies and gentlemen, as we are celebrating his birthday today, for all those watching us from across the 12 countries who have signed up to this conference and watching, this is the message you want. We are looking for transformational leaders. You may be sitting here at the conference center or at the great hall of the University of Ghana. You may be in your respective countries, in your homes, in your institutions, or wherever. Africa is searching for transformational leaders. Are you the one? Am I the one? Or we could all be from our communities, in our homes, in our institutions, in our tribes, meetings, or ethnic groups, whichever way, in academic institutions, in our business offices, there is the need to begin demonstrating leadership and care for ourselves, for our people, for our children, for our families, for our countries, and for our continent, Africa. For these great two men, they were looking for a uniformed, united Africa from the Organization of African Unity to the African Union, whether unity or union, we're looking for one continent where there's no boundaries or there are no borders 
or there are no divisions amongst us, which is not the case today. But as I said earlier, it's a clarion call to all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to so say so much. Once again, we are going to, with a hand of applause, receive Her Excellency Grace Janet Mason, the High Commissioner for South Africa to Ghana, who is going to give us her address and why we're having this conference. Thank you. Siabole Lankos, Program Coordinator. Your Majesty, Nana, Chairperson of this auspicious occasion, I say to you, Molweni. My brother and colleague, His Excellency, the Ambassador of Iran, Professor Nana Jane Opoku Ajeman, former Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Coast, you're welcome the representative of the IGP, Yabule Lankos, distinguished guests, Nana, I reiterate your words. Today is indeed a spiritual occasion. I'm honored to be part of this auspicious leadership conference, program coordinator, your chronological sequence of history and these great leaders is correct. They were not destined to meet, but they were destined for great things, and this is why we come here on this day to celebrate great leaders, and I'm humbled and honored to give this memorial lecture on these great leaders of our great continent. on the birthday of Kwame Nkrumah. I would like to commence with invoking their immortal spirits and their immortal words as I would like to quote. And I quote, those who judge us merely by the heights we have achieved would do well to remember the depths from which we started, unquote, Kwame Nkrumah. Another great leader, my father, during the Ravona trial, I will quote his immortal words. I have dedicated my life to the struggle of the African people. I have fought against white domination. 
and I have fought against black domination. I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and a free society in which all people will live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal I wish and hope to live by and see realized. But my Lord, if needs be, it is also an ideal for which I am prepared to die. Unquote. Nelson Rolitlatla Mandela. Program coordinator, as this conference on leadership on Africa, transformational leadership commenced yesterday. You are correct. We deliberated on what a transformational leader is. We discussed the geopolitical landscape of our continent, the peace and security architecture of our continent, Agenda 2063. I say to all my African brothers that are here, that have come from this beautiful continent, and those that are joining us virtually, and especially to the youth, if you want to see a transformational African leader, a true Pan-Africanist, look in the mirror. I would also like to briefly, as we discussed the geopolitical Politics Agenda 2063, South Africa's position, our foreign policy perspectives that's enshrined in our constitution, and the very texture of Ubuntu that I am because you are. I would like to just reiterate the address of President Saro Ramaphosa on the 19th of September 2023, two days ago, at the 78th UN General Assembly. I will reiterate, and this speaks about our continent. It speaks about Agenda 2030, Agenda 2063. Democratic South Africa has consistently advocated for dialogue, recognition, and diplomacy to prevent and end conflict and achieve lasting peace. It has committed itself to the promotion of human rights, human dignity, justice, democracy, and the adherence of international law. From the experience of our own journey, from the apartheid to democracy, we value the importance of engaging all parties in conflict to achieve peaceful, just, and enduring resolutions. It is these principles that the South African participation in the Africa Peace Initiative, which seeks a peaceful resolution of the conflicts between Russia and Ukraine. Our participation as 
Africans in the Africa Peace Initiative is informed by a desire to see an end to the suffering of those mostly affected by the conflict and the millions of our continent and across the world who, as a result of the conflict, are now vulnerable to worsening hunger and deprivation. I further also speak about the President's address as he speaks to the issues on the Sustainable Development Goals and the achievement of the Sustainable Goals also depends on the fundamental empowerment of women at all spheres of our lives to achieve Agenda 2030. Distinguished guests, I would also like to give you an update on the outcomes of our BRICS Summit, which was held just a few weeks ago in South Africa. And I'd also like to report back by the Chair of the BRICS, President Cyril Ramaphosa, as he says that South Africa has always stressed the values of the BRICS Alliance to advance Africa's development agenda. The summit deliberated on the opportunities presented by the African continental free trade area and the potential to shift Africa from an exporter of raw material to a producer of manufactured goods. The significant outcomes of the summit was a decision to extend the membership of BRICS to include Argentina, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the United Emirates. The BRICS leaders also agree that the value of BRICS extends beyond the interest of its current members, that they agree that the BRICS would be more effective and have a greater impact by building partnerships with other countries and that share the same aspirations and perspectives. Distinguished guests, as we are here to celebrate the remarkable legacy of a man who has advanced for peace, demonstrating a high level of forgiveness, even to the worst of offenders, an apartheid regime and champion a positive thinking in which he believed the ultimate achievement of peace and democracy not only for South Africa but for the continent. That we begin to create the Africa that we want, Agenda 2063. I will continue to ask the young leaders that are here to seek a transformational leader. You are the future generation of our continent. Look in the mirror and you will see the next leader, transformational leader. We depend on you and rely on you as we had our forefathers, a great leader, Kwame Nkrumah, Nelson Rolitlatla Mandela. I would like to conclude 
by saying, Nkosi Sikelele e Africa. God bless our peaceful and prosperous continent. Nyabonga. Thank you very much, Your Excellency Grace Janet Mason. We're most grateful to you for your words of encouragement. And indeed, Africa is looking for transformational leaders. As I mentioned earlier, it could be you, it could be me. Let's begin to identify ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the key partners of organizing this conference is Africans Rising. Africans Rising is a movement across the continent in over 52 countries, and we have a strong message. We were supposed to have the Secretary General of the Pan-African Youth Union, who couldn't make it, to speak on this African Rising project. But we still have the country coordinator here. He's going to make an appeal to all of us. We are all going to make an appeal to ourselves that we are saying that we are looking for Africa for justice, for peace, and for dignity. That is the Africa we want. So I'm going to invite my brother Prince, who is going to chant what we are looking for with African Rising. Please join. Let's give him a round of applause. Um. Hello, Nana, and Your Excellencies, and all protocol duly observed. My name is Prince Akpa. I'm the Engagements Officer for Africans Rising, which is a Pan-African movement. Last year, we gathered citizens from across the continent in Arusha, Tanzania, uh, to discuss the problems of Africa and see how best we, as individuals, can come together and solve it. One of the ethnic issues that we discovered was that even though we are Africa, we are a proud continent. We have borders dividing us, and we are not really proud of it. And it's something that we believe needs to be taken away. So we launched the Borderless Africa campaign. Uh, during our research, we realized that the African Union has started to work on it by creating the protocol for free movement of people on the continent. But it needs more countries uh, to rectify it, and Africans Rising has taken it upon ourselves to get more countries involved in the process. Traveling across the continent is very expensive, so imagine coming to Ghana, our brothers from Cameroon, our brothers from South Africa, coming to Ghana, and at the airport, they have to pay $150. Is it fair? It's not fair at all. This year, somebody came she had $145 on her. The immigration officer accompanied her outside to use the ATM to withdraw the $5 change to, add, to make the money complete. And these are our own brothers. We are all saying that we are all Africans, but we cannot even allow each other into our country. So we believe that if we all come together and make our voice loud, we can be able to get the African Union and our various governments across the continent to act and get this protocol rectify for all of us to enjoy visa free entry to all countries on the continent. So our singular appeal is we have a petition that we have garnered uh, having a lot of Africans signing it and we'll be very glad. I know some of us signed it yesterday, but we'll be very glad if you were not part of us yesterday, you can also sign the petition. So together we can have one voice and present this petition to the African Union and also get more Africa countries to rectify the bill. So I have volunteers around. They'll be passing some cardboards. We have a QR code on it, and the QR code can enable you to have access to the petition and sign it. And we'll be really glad that as we have Nana Noom and our excellencies here, they would also add their voices to ensure that if we want to travel to South Africa, we'll also be able to go there free of charge. We don't have to apply for visa. It's a clear call for all of us, and I'm sure in the long run, our children, our great-grandchildren will also get to benefit from it. Thank you so much, and have a lovely day.
Thank you very much, my brother Prince. So um, briefly, what we're going to do is that the, um, the military band is going to give us what they call, no, not what they call, it's actually patriotic songs. Just for a while, then there is um, a card that is going round. Um, it comes, you just pick your phone, and then you, the QR code on your phone, you just scan it. We need as many um, uh, signatures as possible to be able to um, sign up to the African Rising Movement and our call for a borderless Africa. So if we could please have the band ready to give us just about five, seven minutes of patriotic songs, and then we'll start doing the collection of the signatures and prepare ourselves for the other messages. You can also go to the website of African Rising it's africanrising.org, and then sign up on it, or just do the QR code on your phones. Perspective of your nationality and your residence. So you can be an African in a diaspora, you will certainly come home. We want an Africa where we can all move across borders and would not have any necessary limitations. And today, as we remember him or celebrate his birthday, we would want to step in the aspirations he had, the aspirations Nelson Mandela had, the aspirations where Patrick Mumba had, the aspirations Muhammad Gaddafi had, and the many of our African leaders who have passed the ball, we continue to hold on to the court.
wish to announce to all patrons that this program is also streaming live on Joy News channel and also on the Joy News Facebook and those as well. I think we, we should be bringing the exercise to it an end so that we can continue the program. After the program, we can still be signing on. I think the, um, the codes, the QR codes will be made available to us. Thank you very much once again, the Army Band. The natural person, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, our guests. Our sergeant for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, yes, indeed, was a president, but he was also a politician. We all know the history of Ghana's politics when he began with the UGCC in 1947. In less than two years, it became necessary that he began his own political party, the Convention People's Party, in 19, on June 12, 1949. It's so interesting to know that in just less than two years, in 1951, he won the next major election when the Legislative Assembly was being formed. We, are, we have some political parties here being represented, and we are going to, they are going to give a solidarity message we start from our very own Convention People's Party. And today they have been represented by a member of the legal committee of the party and who is showing his head of wanting to be what I will not mention. Ladies and gentlemen, please, with a round of applause, let's welcome Comrade Wayo Ganamanti to deliver a solidarity message for the Convention People's Party. And please, you are just about three minutes. A very good evening to you all. From Chichiamo. Excellencies, our protocol observed. I bring you greetings from the Convention People's Party. And the MC is my comrade, and he said he will not mention. So it will be mentioned. As we celebrate our subject of Kwame Nkrumah, history is in the making. And Excellency, the South African High Commissioner may declare, and it is clear to the youth, we know it already, that it's time for the youth. It's ringing all over the place. Kwame Nkrumah was 48 years when he had independence. So it's time for the youth. And as I sat down and I heard the echo what the youth are thinking, it's very important. And the MC said he will not mention, but it's clear, and those who follow, follow, that I'm aspiring to be a flag bearer of the CPP. Because I'm at 48, and at 48, we got independence. At 48, the youth will rise once again. So I bring you shortly that the CPP is rising. And the message for the campaign will be two. All Ghanaians who are 50 years and above, I say to them, Yepamocho, please have mercy on us and think about your generation that you are leaving behind. All the youth 50 years and below, because I'm 48 years, I can say that many say more. So I bring you good tidings, and together we can move forward. So the youths I see here, don't doubt, don't shake your head, don't say this man. Because why? As I stand here, I'm older than the president of France. He's 45 years old, I'm 40, 48 years old. I'm older than the prime minister of England. He's 43 years old, I'm 48 years old. So we know what we are about. And when the speaker, the keto speaker said, he said, know your content. So the youth knows their content. And Ghana is rising. So the CPP, Kwame Nkrumah, is rising once again. 
Mandela and Kwame Nkrumah are echoing that this particular celebration for this year is a resounding message that the CPP is rising. And I'll say to Her Excellency, uh, the former running mate to His Excellency, the pres former President John Mahama, that if it's possible and she's in the race, and the CPP gives me the nod, we shall be in the race. And we'll all be speaking to the youth of this country. So please, Kwame Nkrumah celebration is just to let you understand this year that the CPP is ready. The transformation we need is about to begin. The seven-year development plan has not been touched. It will be touched. Industrialization and modernization of agriculture. These are the two major things in the seven-year development plan. Ghana has never touched it. And as I see the COP here, I will say that there will be an IGP in the new CPP. And that IGP is what? Irrigate Ghana project. So that we we'll irrigate Ghana all over the place. And that is how we are modernizing agriculture. When we irrigate, there will be more production. Singapore did it. Malaysia did it. We say Malaysia, they came to take uh, palm, oil, palm oil or palm kernel from here. So that is agriculture. So I'm saying that when we irrigate the whole country, you will see the transformation we need. This is just but one of what is going to come. No political party has told you yet. We have not started releasing the transformation we are bringing. But today, you have gotten one. The IGP that we are going to irrigate Ghana all over the place from the north to the south. So that at the end of the day, we will not be importing tomatoes and onions. Now that the onions can come, we are in trouble. So CPP, 21st September, as we celebrate today, the message is that the CPP is rising. Thank you very much. Hey, CPP, come and give solidarity message. You've given a campaign message. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we also have a representative of the National Democratic Congress, comrade, senior comrade, Kofi Atto, who also delivered a solidarity message for the NDC. I hope it will not become another campaign message. I am past 48, so I'm not qualified to be a president. So I, mine would not be a campaign message. But Nana Temen, and uh, I would like to recognize all the dignitaries uh, here. And on behalf of um, NDC, I'd like to express our solidarity with the um, program that is on um, today. Uh, if you look at the agenda, the, the theme the Osajifu and the Madiba Global Africa in Search of Transformational Leadership. This is exactly what we need to um, express to our people. Um, my agreement with the previous speaker, what I was going to talk about really, is about the youth. I would like the, the group, this group, and all other groups that are talking about Pan-Africanism to join hands with us to carry this message of Pan-Africanism to our schools. Our youths should not stumble into it only when they get to university and they are taking course 101 in political science. This whole, I mean, we long ago, we started a movement from the Dubois Center where we were forming Pan-African clubs in secondary schools. They should learn about Kwame Nkrumah. When, when the Madiba quotation was on, the young man sitting by me knew every word of it and was reciting it. How many of Kwame Nkrumah's quotations, the very important things that he has said to Africa, do we know? Let, let's forget about our generation. If it is a lot that is, what about the ones coming behind us? So I would like to propose to those who organize these things that it should be a one-week celebration. We should form Pan-African groups. So that from about the 15th of September to the, 30, uh, to the 21st, there will be activities all over the country uh, based on ideas of Madiba, on ideas of Kwame Nkrumah, Julius Nyerere, all our top African leaders. We should know about them. We should have symposia. We should have debates. 
We should have quiz contest. And on the 21st, it should culminate in symposium or anything like that. Because if we wait for one year and come to Great Hall and talk about Kwame Nkrumah, then we have left 364 days that we don't talk about our leaders again. So I would like to agree with my 48-year-old comrade uh, that we should go on into the field. Let's look for our youths. Let's find them in the secondary schools. Some of the guys who are speaking well now are people who we discovered in the 90s when we started this movement in the Dubois Center. Some of the young men who speak now are people that we inaugurated in various schools. Let's move this whole celebration down the generations and let's, let's organize them. Let us continue talking about Kwame Nkrumah, his vision for Ghana and his vision for Africa, his vision for the world. Let's talk about Madiba, his vision that brought peace to South Africa and his great leadership instinct. Let's, let's, let, us, let us talk about them, but let us take it down to the generations. We, 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 NDC wishes you well, and we, we are looking forward to more of these uh, recognitions even before the appropriate time comes for us to take over. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to call on one more person to give a solidarity message, not because he's from a political party. We have a delegation from Eastern Africa, and they are being led by Honorable Kisembo Tendo Ronex from Uganda. We also have our sister from Tanzania, Congo DR. So we we'll just invite Honorable Kisendo to give us just a short solidarity message. I know we also have our delegation from Nigeria. So I, I believe that Honorable will be speaking for all of you. Just a minute or two. Um, Mze Nana, Excellence Ambassadors, the representative of the IGP, comrades in your respective capacities, uh, I salute you all. As introduced, my name is Kisembo Ronex Tendo. I come from Uganda, one of the countries in the East African community. Um, it's a humbling experience for me to be in Accra for the very first time. I met one of the professors from this very university in India in the year 2008, and she invited me here. I, have, I had never gotten that opportunity until today when I came to this great institution. Uh, it's a humbling experience to see the initiative of Africa rising, Africans rising, where we are signing a petition for a borderless Africa. All we are requesting for as young people from the continent is the domestication of the integration message of our continent. A lot of scholars have talked. We have the likes of Professor Pierre Olumumba and other people who have rallied Africans to unite right from those days. Today we are here marking 60 years of efforts by Africans to unite. Why are we not making progress? There are basic things that we need to focus on, which I'm calling domesticating the agenda. All we are asking for is a borderless Africa. All we are asking for is free movement. Why do you limit me from leaving Ghana to go to Nigeria? Why would I ask for permission to go to a neighbor if we mean the talk that we are brothers and sisters? Let's look at the challenge we are having of peace and security. As I highlighted yesterday, Africa's biggest problem is a governance and leadership challenge. So young people, we don't need to wait for Agenda 2063. As and when we meet, let us take this opportunity right from here to coordinate, take advantage of the social media platforms. We can push the leadership present as we take positions to make sure that we call for change and we must walk the talk. I thank you so much, and I wish you great deliberations as we mark uh, Osage Falls' birthday. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Honorable. Ladies and gentlemen, Nana Chairperson, we've gotten to a climax and to actually hear our message for today, our take home message. As we are celebrating Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, it's important to let everybody know that the University of Cape Coast is also one of the educational institutions that Osage for had established. And our distinguished speaker is not only an alumni of the university, but she had gone through the school, climbed through career to become the first female vice chancellor of the University of Cape Coast. Again, Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, in his delight and his pursuit of ensuring human resource development, science, technology promotion, established the Ghana Academy of Arts and Science. Our distinguished guest of honor is also a fellow of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Science. She's been a teacher, a lecturer, and also for our foreigners, she's been our Minister of Education. So she's not only in lecturing, but she's also been at the helm of policy. In our last election, she became a running mate of our former president, His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, and campaigned across the country with her, with him. Well, the election is also not far from now. We hope to see what comes up. But she's here as a fellow in Krumahist. She's here as an academic. She's here as a pioneer and a role model for not only women, but for all of us. She's been indeed a transformational leader. So if you are selecting a speaker for such an August occasion, she had qualified through all the dimensions and the criteria that you would want to use. We'll let the cultural troupe start with the music as we welcome her. And with all of us with a standing ovation, let's welcome Her Excellency, Professor Jen Nana Opoku Ajimain, who will be giving us the keynote address. everyone can hear me. I have a little cold, so my voice is a bit funny. Nana Chairman, Your Excellencies, our Deputy IGP, or his rep, rather, the musicians, the dancers, members of the press, everyone who is here, good afternoon. Pardon you, are you hungry? Good afternoon. That's better. Thank you so much. Let me begin by thanking the organizers who had invited His Excellency John Dramani Mahama to be here today. But as we are all aware, he's out of the country on other assignments. And therefore, he has asked me to come and stand in for him. And let me continue by saying how absolutely delighted I am to be here and privileged to speak on a topic that I believe and I think should fill our airwaves more often than they do. On a topic that should fill our discourse more consistently as, than it does. As Honorable Atto said, this is not something we should do every year. How about the rest of the time? We are here to discuss not infallible people, not angels, but ordinary people like you and I. But their lives testify 
perhaps to something different from what we, you and I are doing or may do. We know that there are two lives, Madibas and Osajefos, that testify to principled focus, not losing your focus, not falling for the distractions, keeping your eyes on the vision. Their lives also testify to sacrifice, the kind of sacrifice you make without thinking of what you get out of it. You make that sacrifice because it is necessary, because it is the right thing to do. And you just pray that it impacts others positively. What, what was Nkrumah looking for? What was the Madiba looking for? They were looking for the opportunity for others to live better. May we all be guided by that. Their lives also testify to determination, to courage, and to sheer hard work. They gave everything. They sacrificed their families. Those are the ones I think about. They didn't have the time to spend with their own children, to spend with their own wives, to spend with their own families. They gave everything. Are we capable of that? We are searching for leaders. Are we capable of doing that? We can all try because we have the examples. They also had a deep understanding of the implications of their roles as leaders. You are leading. What does it mean? Doesn't mean you are intimidating the people following you. Doesn't mean you think you are better than them. Or do you think that this whole leadership role is to allow me to bring more people out? Is to allow me to groom more people to lead? It's also to recognize that the people I'm leading have better ideas than I do. And therefore, it is worth listening to them. It is worth being humble. It is worth sharing. It is worth mentoring and encouraging. Because just as we have dreams of our own children, we pray that they go further than we have ever gone. And so should we have as leaders for others. But who were they? Were they icons? Were they enigma? Were they praxis? Were they visionary? Were they practice too? Were they Pan-Africanists? They saw the need for unity because they understood our history and they knew the potential to, piece the, to put the pieces together. They knew that without that, we are not going anywhere. If we live in Ghana and Ghana is doing very well and Togo is not and Benin is not and Burkina is not, we are going nowhere. We want leaders like them. But you see, we have the models already. And for a lot of people, these are people they experienced. And for those who didn't, who didn't experience them that well, they left legacies. They left so many legacies that now we can refer to them. Some were able to be in government and were able to reach the youth especially. If you want to reach the youth, you must give them the training they require. You must give them the hands up. The youth are not looking for hands out. They are looking for hands up. And these leaders did that. One went as far as to spend his entire life, or nearly all of it, in prison. It's not because he loved to be there. It's not because he was happy to be away from his children, but because he was focused and he was determined that the fundamentals of justice, of fairness, are what is required for us to build true leaders, for, or rather is what is required of true leaders, so that others can have the best in them come out. So we have the models already. And we stand on their record to speak today. 
And I hope that his role in this university, for example, should not be lost. We have the African studies. I'll come to that in a minute. He also built the University of Cape Coast, which started as a university for science education. That was the original name. Because he understood the importance of science going forward. So he invested in people. He invested in knowledge to make sure that he can reap it. It's the people who bring about the change. It's not the resources in the soil. If we don't know how to mine it, then we just pollute our waters. Where will that take us? So he trained people. How did we lose the way? So he trained people. Then it went on and on. And, you know, we had the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology a long time ago. Today we are talking about STEM as if it's news. It shouldn't be. Where are the teachers? It shouldn't be. We have found it developed. All we need to do is to study it closely and move it even further. It's not news. So we had KNUST, a transition to UST. The KN was knocked off. And then we came back to KNUST. This alone should teach us a lesson. It should teach us the lesson of continuing where others have left off. It's not about beginning all over again, all the time. Then you'll not go very far. Please let us think about this. And there's so much learning about leadership. In fact, I've never seen a word with more definitions than leadership. At the last time I counted, I had about 66 of them. Leadership. We are always talking about it. We need to grow our leaders. We Every person in this room, every person listening can be a leader. Is it in your, in your home? Is it in your environment? What kind of leadership skill are you showing there? Which will follow you even as you went further up? I have had the privilege of touring a couple of registration centers, both in Accra and the central region, in the last couple of days. And I think that the arrangement so far put down has been very successful in deepening the unprogressive and alarming divisions that we don't need. We are talking of Africa uniting. Can we begin with our countries uniting? What is it that separates us? How useful are they? How do they advance our democracy? How do they advance our lives? What examples are we setting for the youth? So that when they get angry and protest, then they are arrested. Of what use is that? What examples have we set for them to follow? Our young persons are now bus, you know, to the various places. This is the way government ought to do. So you leave it to the political parties. What do they do? They bus their people. Deepening further. Is that how we are making progress as a country? And is this the arrangement? Is this the kind of arrangement that Kwame Nkrumah would have made? Is this the kind of arrangement that Nelson Mandela would have made? Why do we have all these examples and still behave as if we have none? Is this a strategy for institutional building, or it is one for effective institution collapse. To top it all, it's one of the most profound statements I've heard this year in my country. I have a whole collection of them. You know I'm in literature. And somebody is even saying, oh, the registration is not even compulsory. Oh, really? I'm sure my Ghana people would have said, where is that statement? And my people from Alabanyo would have said, cho, cho. <laughs> and my friend, Chrissy Pratt, whom I respect very much, would have said, ebe, ebe na sunusuni. Any decision, I don't call them policies because they are not, they are simple decisions that polarize a people along ethnic lines 
is as dangerous as the person who put that decision forward. Africa must unite. Africa must not be torn apart. We have enough problems as it is. Why, why, why amplify them? Where do we think that is taking us? Ethnic rivalry, I see, is the most dangerous of all vices. And Nkrumah fought at this at many levels in our own country. I would like to illustrate why I think that ethnic rivalry is dangerous by referring to the economy. There is no research on the number of transactions that do not occur because people prefer to trade with people of the same ethnic group in this country, to the best of my knowledge. Where are the economists in the room? I stand to be, um, okay, no one is saying anything different so far. Nevertheless, I draw attention to a concept called the velocity of money. The velocity of money. Or to put it in another way, the number of times that the same amount exchanges hands over a period of time. The more that money exchanges hands in an economy, the healthier and more expansive the economy is believed to be. So concentrating it in one place is not helpful. For example, if a farmer buys fish for 100 cities and the fish seller pays medical bills of 100 cities and the and the chemical seller or the pharmacist purchases, let's say, a weighing scale of 100 cities. Then 300 cities has passed through the economy. It's not about, about all kinds of slogans. They've taken us nowhere in this country. The increased economic activity makes that country a whole lot better. And the fundamentals become strong. However, Countries that are es ethnically fragmented will have a lower velocity of money than what they are capable of getting. When people are pushed to trust only those that share their tribe or ethnicity, there will not be as many transactions. This trust will deepen and our gaps will widen. The fundamentals will be weak. Decisions, any decision that leads to polarization will, will breed or yield a weakened society. Fostering a more inclusive society as demonstrated by Kwame Nkrumah and as demonstrated by Nelson Mandela will reduce mistrust. Mistrust is part of the reasons why we are not so together. Sometimes I feel that our derailment from the ideals espoused by Kwame Nkrumah and Nelson Mandela is lack of faith in ourselves. Even to own our weaknesses. We are not angels. You make a mistake, you accept it. It means you want to grow. It means you want to do better. Accepting your mistake doesn't mean that I'm, 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 I've become shorter or I've become taller. It is just that now I didn't do this so well, I can do it better. That is all. And I feel that it is about a sort of identity crisis that we don't even talk about. And it is this identity crisis, the way I see it, that forms the bedrock of Nkrumah's work. And I believe many of you have bothered to read his books. And that lies a long walk to freedom, beautifully crafted. And if we continue, it's always someone else's fault. And that person is unknown. It's always somebody's fault. 
and that person is known, that person may ac accept his or her fault and grow. And the person laying the accusation will be where they are. All of these will create gaps, will not make us unite. We must confront the issues that have led to our separation, our divisions. And I agree with the young people talking, you know, advancing the thoughts of the AU regarding a borderless Africa. In the quest to unite, we must also remember that there are Africans who are forced to live away from the continent. That is also one gap that we need to pay attention to. And they were forced to live in, on many continents. They were forced to live in Canada, on many countries, US, the Caribbean, South America. Read the literature on the diaspora, in, on the uh, Indian Ocean too. We don't even hear about it. But I remember when we first organized Panafest at the University of Cape Coast, and we opened it to the world. Of course, we didn't have money to. It was an interesting thing. At some point, I'll tell you there, or at another forum. Otherwise, I'll be speaking for too long. Tell you the whole story. But we need not to forget about them. So we need to remember the Africans in the diaspora. And I'm not referring only to those we train with monies we don't even have with resources that are taken over by those who should not own them. And I believe some of you have seen the scenes in our embassies. So pathetic to look at. These are people we have trained, whose services we need, who we are showing the path to leave. What kind of unity do we have in mind? What kind of unity do we have in mind? Why are they leaving? Why wouldn't they leave? What is wrong? It is only when we come together and think together. It is only when we are not afraid to express our thoughts that we can find solutions. My 48-year-old um, friend is talking about irrigate, the irrigation. Yes, I hope it's not one district, uh, not one village, one dam. Because we've seen that before, and it didn't work. I am referring to them, of course. <laughs> all of this could be planned properly. Remove the sloganeering and sit down and do the hard work. I wish you well. But I know you'll not beat us, so we'll talk about that another time. <laughs> I'm referring to the, those who were forcefully taken out of this continent, imprisoned, stripped of everything they owned, lived in indignity, and we, they need to form part of our plan to unite. And in the process, to be very careful. You see, I'm happy they come home. But you see, it should be more than vacation. When you are going home, when you want to be part of home, you sacrifice to make the home better. It's not others who build the home so you can just come and see. No, let's embrace them. And let's have programs that work, programs that enrich them so they'll truly feel that they belong. Because the literature has not worked in our favor. In my own research on the African diaspora, I discovered many things. And again, I'll talk too much. You know, it's a topic very close to my heart. And so maybe at another forum, we can discuss that. But I remember that during one of my, or a couple of my um, field research in the Upper West, and I did that research consistently for about 11 years before I came out with my book. So I became very familiar with the area. And I remember the day I walked to the border. 
And I saw this, it's like a cement structure sitting there, and that's supposed to divide the land. You know, those who come from border, line, border towns may attest to this. So the, it's like this um, equipment sitting here, and you are francophones, and we are anglophones, or something crazy like that. And I saw a farm. The farm was like the whole room, and of course the farm didn't mind whether that was francophone or anglophone. I saw children crossing, people speaking from homesteads on both sides, speaking the same language. Language is going to be very important for our unity. And, you know, life was going on. Well, as for the goats, you can't say much about them. So they were also going up and down. You know. And I asked myself, so, some time ago, these people would have had to apply for passports and for visas to attend their neighbor's wedding or whatever social event was taking place. I saw the same thing in Aplao. People are going to school or shopping or trading, but then Aplao gives a different impression because we have erected border, I don't know, posts there. And sometimes even the way they treat people is so shameful. Why? All they want to do is to cross. So I'm very, very much in support of the AU initiative and supported by the young people here that we look at the process of removing all these barriers. Why should they happen? Who put them there? As young people here, I believe you know the history, so I don't need to talk about it. You do. And if you don't, you find out the, the uh, Berlin Conference of 1844, and it's all there. Okay. So, I ask myself again, so where does, you know, this is the whole, the same family. And this is their land. And somebody has decided that, you know, they should communicate in another language. And as I said, similar issues abound at other borders of people with the same language and culture. And they are defying the separation where they can. When we get any opportunity, we need to interrogate the subject. We must interrogate the borders. Our history does not begin with independence. Our history does not even begin with the, with the European slave trade. And if you have any doubt, that is how Aiko Yama puts it. Says we are not a people of yesterday. And if you want to know our origins, you should go to the beach and count the sand one grain after the other. And when you are at the end of it, you know who Africans are. We should never accept that we are second class citizens. Where did studies begin in this world? The alphabet we write was the origin. I urge the youth to be curious, to ask questions. Where was the first university? All of a sudden we are told we don't read. Says who? And if anybody has any, are there any Ethiopians here? Okay, if you ever have a chance and you visit either at Zoom or where the rock hewn churches are, you will learn the true story of Christianity and it will help you. I just leave it there. We are supposed to believe that we are surrounded by so many francophones that we should all learn French. I'm a French scholar too, but that's not why I studied French. So we must all go and learn a language we don't use in order to be connected with our relatives who speak the same language as we do. It is very logical. 
I'm an Ebe. I live in Denu. I should learn French before I go and communicate with my relative in Aplao. All along, what language were we using? And every time you raise a language issue, oh, you hear many, many reasons why it's not possible. So, if people say we are surrounded by francophones, I say that we are also surrounded by the Bono. We are surrounded by the Eves. We are surrounded by the Sisali. We are surrounded by the Enzimas, and they've been communicating all the time. So why, why do we bring difficult solutions to simple problems? You see why we are divided, and why we are not going as fast as we could. This is a topic we need to explore at another forum. For the time being, the notion that we can only remove the barriers through learning a language we have been learning for hundreds of years and we still don't speak properly should tell us that we've been doing something not so right. I've always wondered why we ignore obvious solutions, fight them, and find many reasons why the obvious solutions will not work and embrace solutions we have been trying to implement forever and which have left huge gaps making our forward march as a continent and a country so painfully frustrating. That is my conclusion. And I want to ask us, how many of us do not want a united Africa? How did we get here that we are so suspicious of each other? How did we get here? I'm sure many of us don't even know the country if they showed us the map of Africa. We may not know the country this gentleman from Uganda spoke from. But we can learn. It's never late. We shouldn't make our transformation so difficult. Nelson Mandela quotes his biography. The title is, A Long Walk to Freedom. Let's make the walk, the walk shorter. And we can make it shorter by referring to Kwame Nkrumah's publication, Africa Must Unite. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Um, yesterday we had Professor Fremont Boat and we had Dr. Makiba who also joined the panel yesterday. We are most grateful to you, Madam. We also have Honorable who joined. All the panels, almost everybody sitting in the front seat had been on the panel yesterday and it was out of three sections and it was such a blast yesterday. I left the scene and I was being called, please come in here. People don't want to close the conference and go home. And it was awesome. And for all our delegates who came from both flying and those who came by bus, especially from Nigeria, there were about three students from Nigeria who came by bus and I was surprised. It was so awesome. We we most grateful. This is a conversation that has begun. Kwame Nkuma meant it. The current generation should mean it. We say Nkuma never dies, and this is what it means. That in several years, some time ago when you mentioned Nkuma, we were expected to be old men and women. But now you will have the 15s and the 20s and the 40s and the 48s. And they're joining the 48s. So that is the 40th that we'll be going into. We are most grateful to everybody. And for your excellency, Madam, you're so awesome. I know it's been hard pulling you and getting you to help us to pull this conference together. We are most grateful. And thank you very much. Nana, what can we say? It's been so wonderful. And the first time I was told that Nana had registered on the, on the conference website, I didn't believe it. That Nanas don't go on conference website to go and register for conferences. We go with snaps and drinks and go and invite them. We are most grateful to you again, sir. And Your Excellency, so wonderful for the solidarity you share with us. And sir, when you see COPs, they are close to IGPs. So you should be looking for a COP as a friend or ACP as a friend very soon. He's an IGP and we are out there. Thank you so much for making the time to be with us and standing for the IGP. And for all of us, it's been an awesome two days and a journey that has really begun. Africa has a future because today has happened. And we're going to have a... Let me tell you a story. I, I traveled to Nigeria. I was in Calabar and I have to make a transition to go for a meeting in Bamenda. So I picked a vessel from Calabar to Tiko. I just got to Tiko and they asked, where's your visa? And I said, oh, I'm a West African. He said, yes, now you are now in East Africa. I said, oh, I'm in Cameroon. He said, yes, Cameroon is East Africa. So where's your visa? And it's quite an interesting, it's, I may say it now and laugh. Yeah, I was given two options back then, to pay 350,000 SIFA, or there was a van, they I should go and sit in the van, and I asked where I was going. I was going to prison for two weeks. When they finish, they bring me back to the same place and deport me. They deport me that same day. So when I spoke to African Rising, you know, they asked that they, this is the message they wanted to share. I said, you have no idea of my two-day visit to Cameroon. I was going for training, leadership training in Bamenda at my own expense, and I'm being arrested because... I don't have a visa, and I didn't know. And I asked, do you have an embassy in Ghana? No. A high commission? No. Why were you expecting me to get a visa? I was supposed to travel from Accra to Lagos and acquire a visa for Cameroon in Africa here and get all the way to Calabar before crossing and getting to what trouble did I have in trying to go for leadership training in another country or within in another town or city in Africa? But I have to be subjected to this. So this subject of borderless Africa is not just a conversation. It is true and it is real. We all need to get into that conversation. Thank you all so much for making time to join with us. So on behalf of the organizers, the Kwame Nkrumah Center for Governance and Leadership, the Institute of African Studies, the South African High Commission, which has been very supportive, and all our sponsors, Jibu Water, the Mineral... Um, the, um, um, MTN has been with us. We are also being supported by Multi Choice. We are being supported by Joy FM, the multimedia group, who have been awesome for us, transmitting this event live on their channels since yesterday until today. And all the media houses that give us coverage, the Pan African TV, we are most grateful. Please, I hope I have not, I had a sight of um, 
one very important personality on our midst, the 2012 presidential candidate of the Convention People's Party. Please, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Abu Sakara. In my conclusion, I almost, Dr. you almost welcome and thank you for honoring the event. We thank you all very much. And then, please, after we finish here, there's refreshment on my right hand side. But we'll kindly wait for our dignities to file out before we all rush out again, please. Thank you very much. I think that's more for the announcement. We'll be having a group photograph together. Um, I think there's a, a backdrop here. So we'll all go there and take a, a group photograph together with our distinguished um, personalities. And then, then we'll be able to um, go for the refreshment. So we wish you thank you all for making the time to come. Since we began the program with the chairman opening the event and giving his remark, we'd like to invite our chairman once again to tell us how he has seen this event and his closing remark, then we'll finish. Immediately when the chairman finishes his closing remark, we are going to rise up for the national anthem for South Africa and Ghana once again, and we'll be closing. So the chairman's closing remark. Thank you very much, our great presenter. I am so overwhelmed. I am so excited to see Africans in this room, my own people, whether you come from Zimbabwe, South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria. I'm very excited. The African unity is long, long overdue. I am so impressed to hear from the South African ambassador to Ghana in her delivery. She is talking about peace and unity. And we all know what that means peace, and unity. I'm happy also to hear from Jane Poku Anana, Poku Nana, Nana Jane Poku Ajiman, former Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Coast. She and I go way back. I used to visit her office a lot to be sitting here. I'm also in appreciative of having the IGP representative here as our nation's finest security. I'm also happy to have Africa's friend from Iran sitting here. Ambassador, you are welcome. See, my chairmanship doesn't come easy at all for me to give you a small, short, brief history. You see, when Kwame Nkrumah won the election, he was in prison at Osha Fort. At that time, my father was a police officer in Adabraka. My father was the chauffeur who drove Kwame Nkrumah out of Osha Fort. My father's name is Charles Henry Timons. He drove Kwame Nkrumah out of Osha Fort. Also, my predecessor, who I succeeded the chieftaincy from, his name is Kwesi Bat Plange. Kwesi Bat Plange was the first secretary of CBP. If many of you don't know, Kwesi Batplange was the first secretary of CPP. So sitting here and sharing Osaji for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's birthday and having all these very important Africans from all over 
I'm so happy to say. We have honored Kwame Nkrumah. We have honored Kwame Nkrumah after they break down all his statues and everything. We rebuild it. It has been renovated. There's more left to be done in his name. One, to remove Kotoka name off from the airport. I am appealing to Nana Adodankwa Akufuado, our president of the day, to understand that Kotoka doesn't deserve to be on our airport and that Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's name should be on our airport for us to honor him very well. And I appreciate all the organizers for a great job done. I believe next year, when we celebrate Kwame Nkrumah's birthday again, it will be greater and greater than this year. Thank you all for coming. Everyone should reach home peacefully. Every one of you should go and think about the African unity, our way forward, the transformation. The 2026 should be tomorrow, not wait for 2026. Tomorrow we start. And very shortly, we should see the result before 2026, uh, 20, 2063 comes. Please. We can't wait because I won't be alive. 2063, I won't be here. And I want to see before I leave. Please. We have to work hard. Africa unity is very, very important. The reason why they are cheating us, the European nations are cheating us, Africans, is because we are not united. Africa should have by now have Africa Monetary Fund. The IMF that the Europeans has created, we should have Africa Monetary Fund for the whole Africa continent. We, we can achieve that. When the African Union put their head together, can't we create Africa Monetary Fund? Whereby any African country needs money don't have to go to Europe, don't have to go to America, but right here at home on the continent, we can go for money. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nana Chairman, for your, I think we all enjoyed these remarks. I think we are actually coming to begin the, the, the conference. We are most grateful to you once again, um, Nana. Um, I broke a little protocol, but fortunately, this is a Pan-African um, conference, and our culture matters a lot. You all realize that we've had a visitor. Not, we don't want to call him a visitor for so, those, of us, those of us who are socialists, because the Iran state is a friend to us. So please, I will indulge you, Nana, although we've given our remarks, closing remarks, so that we have His Excellency to deliver a little solidarity message all right. Thank you very much, Your Majesty. I am Commissioner, Professor, and Mr. Kamandu. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I am very proud to participate in your valuable gathering. Thank you very much. I am not in the program, but only I wanted to thank you and uh, say my appreciation to uh, uh, coordinator. Thank you very much for everybody. Thank you all. So please, shall we be on our feet? We'll take the two national anthems, uh, national anthem of the Republic or South Africa, and then we'll do the national anthem of Ghana.
Thank <laughs> you.